Thank you so much, Dana. And uh, thank you so much to the Monmouth County Historical Association uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to, to tell a little bit about uh, some of the more interesting stories I've come across as I've been researching uh, 400 years of, of regional history. And so as uh, Dana mentioned, uh, I am the founder and editor of MonmouthTimeline.org, which is a website. Um, it looks like this today. It, you know, looked a little bit different. Um, it's we're going through a redesign. We're already at that phase. But Mama Timeline aggregates the uh, presents the illustrated history of Mama County um, by presenting the best stories from the best storytellers. Uh, and so we have over 250 stories now um, across uh, over a dozen different categories. Everything from um, Black history and women's history to ships and shipwrecks, sports and science heroes and celebrities, the Revolutionary War, Fort Monmouth, you name it. Um, and we highlight the best of these stories um, on social media through syndicated graphic features that we call This Day in Monmouth County History. Um, we just uh, show you uh, some of the most incredible stuff um, that has happened in this region, um, which never uh, ceases to amaze me. Um, and so when I first founded uh, the timeline in my uh, first year, I was um, you're picking all the low-hanging fruit and putting up all the st stories that were um, sort of obvious and necessary. And, and along the way, coming to, dis to find out that, um, that Vito Genovese, one of the most um, famous and notorious figures in uh, American organized crime history, actually lived in Monmouth County. So was that, well, that was an obvious one. Um, and uh, by the... Um, so I started researching it, but I kept tripping over references to Vito's mansion. So sometimes there was a reference to Vito's uh, Middletown mansion, and sometimes a reference to his Atlantic Highlands mansion. And I and I do know that there are neighborhoods in that part of our our county where um, some people have an Atlantic Highlands postal address, but who pay their property taxes to Middletown Township. And so I thought, is this one mansion or is it two? And I thought there has to be a ton of this out there. Um, this, is, this is one of those, again, this is one of those legendary famous figures in, in mafia history. And then it turns out, well, there was, uh, yeah, I was right that there was, there was just an immense amount of, of information out there about um, his uh, activities um, on the criminal side. Uh, but in terms of his domestic life and, and his life and times in New Jersey, almost nothing, almost nothing at all. And so I had to start at the beginning and start by capturing every single mention of, of uh, Vito uh, uh, and, and Anna Genovese um, in New Jersey um, that I could find and, and, and just, you know, sort of uh, turn over all the stones I possibly could. And, and uh, just as when I thought that I had, um, I had, I had uh, found everything there was to find, uh, again, this is like a couple of years ago, 2020, I, I learned that just a, a couple of months before, in, in the fourth quarter of 2019, that a podcast had come out called Mob Queens, which had focused only and specifically on the story of Anna Genovese. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're not um, into podcasts, uh, I wasn't, so that was why it was so easy for me to miss it at the time. Um, but uh, the thing about podcasts is that um, it, it is another medium in which a lot of very, very serious journalism is taking place. And I was very impressed with the depth and, uh, uh, and, and legitimacy of the research that the producers of the Mob Queens people did. They 
Um, they hired professional specialist investigators, for example, to help them with an FBI Freedom of Information Act request so they could get Anna's FOIA file. So I, I was impressed, which doesn't mean you take everything, um, you know, uh, without a grain of salt. But um, and then, um, you know, a, after I had sort of put everything together uh, last year, a, a new book came out called The, the Deadly Dawn. And it, it didn't really break a lot of new ground. But it also but it did um, establish that there are some some discrepancies. And so as we go through, uh, I'm going to try and, and, and um, you know, stick as close as I can to the facts. And, and I, I at this point, you know, just to you know, be fair to everybody that, you know, this is a story about a family and all families have um, problems. Uh, all families have secrets. Um, you, you know, very, very few of us know everything. Um, about the families of even those, um, you know, friends and family that were that we were, were close to, uh, that, that, that it's been likened to an iceberg where um, how much you actually know about someone else's family is what's visible, but the vast majority of, of the truth um, lies out of sight. And and uh, so I, I just keep that in mind um, as we go through. So this picture, as we get let's as we get going, is not New Jersey, believe it or not. Uh, that's 52nd Street, New York in the 50s. Uh, it was uh, the height of jazz and entertainment. And you could just get in a cab in those days and just say, take me to the strip. And they would take you to 52nd Street. And so this is a story about New Jersey. But it's a story about New Jersey that, like so many, starts in New York. But this one actually starts in, in Italy. And so let's, uh, let's uh, with that, uh, move on to, uh-oh, who's Diane Smolinski? Dana? Um, it's okay. I don't see anything on your screen, so. You don't uh, see. Somebody, Diane is requesting remote, somebody's saying is requesting remote control of my screen. <laughs> well, don't give it to them. <laughs> no, I'm declining. Uh, yeah, but not I don't see there that, go. Okay. So go ahead. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's weird. So yeah. let's, 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 uh, meet our star-crossed lovers. Um, Vito Genovese on the left and, uh, uh, Giovannina Pitillo. That's a woman who's known, became known as Anna. And, uh, they, uh, Vito, this is Vito. He was born in 1897, came to the United States in 1913. Uh, at age 13, um, lived in Little Italy, and pretty much as soon as he was a very young adult, went to work for uh, um, people who were on pretty much the wrong side of the, of the law. And uh, there's Anna. Hello. She's eight years younger than Vito, but she actually came to the U.S. Uh, several years before him. Um, and she lived in Little Italy, and uh, believe it or not, um, even as a young uh, person, she worked in restaurants. And if you've ever been to Little Italy, you know, well, that's pretty much what there is. The Little Italy is a lot of restaurants. So well, that comes as no surprise. And uh, they're not just both from Italy originally. They're both from the Naples area, but they're not just from the Naples area. Pay attention to that little red dot up there. That's a little outside of Naples. This is Vicigliano. <laughs> this is a modern day satellite image of Riciliano, and it doesn't look like a big bustling metropolis now. Imagine what this looked like in, in 1899. It had to have been essentially sort of a community of a small number of you know, families or whatever, but at any rate, um, uh, that's how close uh, uh, Vito and Anna were uh, in their early years. And so it, it, when you look at it this way, it's not a surprise. They were fourth cousins. So the early years. At age 19, Vito spent the year in prison for illegal possession of a firearm. This is the only time that Vito Genovese will be convicted of a crime for the next 50 years until the feds finally put him away for good. This man found a way to skate the law his entire life. Tells you how smart he was. That's, a, that's one way, that, that's the first thing, smart and ruthless. 1922, March 12th, Vito married a woman named Donata Ragone and, and they had a daughter named Nancy. 
Anna, in the meantime, married someone named Gerard Bonatico, who on the census records was listed as a baker. And they had a daughter named Marie. This is, this is the love part of the love, death, and betrayal. Ah, uh, 1931, Donata Ragon died of tuberculosis. Well, maybe she died of tuberculosis. What we, all we do know is that she died in a hotel room and that a, a, a doctor, a private doctor signed a death, a death certificate saying that she had died of tuberculosis. But this is, what a this is during a time when there were tuberculosis clinics available specializing in this disease as best they could at the time. Um, but she wasn't at a tuberculosis clinic. And of course, uh, you know, Vito was, extreme, you know, was, was doing extremely well, um, you know, with his, um, you know, as he escalated the, um, you know, lucky Luciano crime family uh, uh, ladder. Um, so they had money. And so they could have afforded a, a, a top flight hotel or excuse me, hospital room uh, with the absolute best of care. But instead, they chose a hotel room and a private doctor. And so there are a lot of people who wonder if, in fact, she really did die of tuberculosis. Now, that same year, Anna filed for divorce uh, from Gerard. Um, now, here there's some discrepancies um, in, in what uh, is reported by the Deadly Dawn author and the Mob Queens producers, because the, because the, the, they both looked at the same paperwork and came to two different conclusions. Um, but uh, it, it would seem as though the divorce was not granted. Uh, it was very difficult in those days for a woman to initiate divorce proceeding and win. Didn't happen very often. Um, and so uh, that's January. Just a couple of months later, Gerard Vernotica was strangled on a rooftop uh, on, along with another man who was you know, just, you know, that sort of classic uh, trope of in the wrong place at the wrong time. And later on, um, Vito, Vito Genovese henchman Joe Valachi will testify that he had that hit carried out at Vito's behest, but he didn't know why. Because when someone like Vito, uh, you know, ex expects somebody to be killed, he, he doesn't give you reasons and you don't ask. And so uh, all we know, this is, you know, is that um, uh, Gerard Vernotico was murdered and two weeks later, Anna and Vito are married. And six months later, uh, they had a son, Philip, and that's Philip A. Genovese, future Shrewsbury Board of Education member, Philip Genovese, future Shrewsbury Town Council member, Philip Genovese, just to give you an idea of uh, why this really is a New Jersey story. And so moving on. So now they're married. They got a blended family. They need a new home. They, they, they get some swanky digs in this particular uh, building at 29 Washington Square West. That's a modern day photo of it. It's still there and it is still ridiculously expensive, but it only cost them 180 a month at the time. And Eleanor Roosevelt lived in that building, just to give you an idea of how swanky it was. And Anna returned to working note nightclubs and Vito kept doing what he was doing, which was a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that we don't have time to cover today. And next, well, now we have it. Now there's some speculation about why this happened, but the next thing that happened was in 1935, and Vito, Vito bought a mansion um, in uh, Middletown, and specifically uh, a mansion on um, Red Hill Road, which is now Deep Cut Park. And uh, at the time, it had originally been the Taylor Farm, and the Taylor Farm had been broken up into parcels and sold off. And uh, the original uh, English Georgian style mansion was built by a couple named Edward and Teresa Dangler. And this is the only known photograph of the Dangler mansion that exists. And maybe it's a reason why that is that that they didn't live there very long. They didn't have any children. And if you don't have, if you have kids, you take a lot of pictures. But if you don't, you know, maybe maybe not. Uh, and Edward took sick um, not long after. Um, that they had this house built and died, and um, and, and Teresa, the, the the widow dangler, uh, sold it to a woman named Flora Sperling, and she sold it in turn to uh, Vito Genovese, and Vito um, hired Dominic Caruso, who was the, probably the most prominent builder, home renovator, 
in that area, when, when we looked at the land records, um, putting together the research, you know, on, on this, uh, um, it, you know, we, we were looking at land records and Dominic Caruso's name is all up and down these pages. So he was by, he was, he was a flipper before that was even a thing. Anyway, Dominic Caruso brought in um, Lovett Nurseries from Little Silver uh, to create these fabulous gardens. And uh, they put in a three hole golf course. Um, you know, it was a, it, it, you know, it was turned from just a mansion into a lavish um, Italian villa of the type that the wealthiest people of Italy um, would, have, would have felt right at home. And one of the things that Vito insisted on was that there be a miniature working model of Mount, Mount Vesuvius. That's still there. You can go to Deep Cut Park and you can still see that. That's another modern day photo. Um, now, uh, this was supposed to be a summer home and, um, uh, but for some reason, after only a couple of years of pouring a ton of money and lavish furnishings and all these improvements to the property, um, uh, Vito goes to Italy. Now, again, here we have, you know, uh, different versions of what happened when in 1937. There are some versions that say that Vito and Anna went on vacation. But why would you go on vacation in Italy when you've just spent two years outfitting your brand new summer home in Middletown? I don't know. I, I, maybe that's a maybe. Who you knows? Maybe there was a a reunion. But uh, the other versions have that what was also going on in 1937 was that a murder um, that could be traced back to uh, Vito um, per Joe Valachi, that that some of the um, principals involved were in police custody, and were, you know, uh, you know, again, people in the organized crime business in those years had really good connections within the police department. And the word was that somebody was ratting out Vito um, on a murder charge and that he went to Italy um, before he could get um, arrested and served. And uh, well, what did Vito do when he got to Italy in 1937? We tried to get next to Benito Mussolini. And that's Benito Mussolini's son-in-law in that photo. Uh, and uh, he, was a, he was a cocaine addict. And you'll never guess where he got his cocaine from. Yeah, Vito, Vito became his cocaine source. Vito uh, also wanted to try and help um, build a fabulous mansion for the fascist party in Italy that, that Mussolini led. And so, by the way, that army uniform, we'll, we'll get to that later, what, why Vito would have been wearing an army, American army uniform while he was in Italy. We'll get to that in just a sec. Um, so uh, while Vito's in Italy, Anna, ever the loyal wife, is making these transatlantic voyages. Here, here you see you know, where they may have first gone across and obviously a luxury liner. You see the racing horses in the background and sort of a famous kind of uh, 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 preoccupation of some of those old luxury liners. And, and uh, now there's a picture of Anna by herself. She doesn't look quite as thrilled by it when she's alone, but what she's, you know, what she did was over these years, you know, at least until World War One broke out, or excuse me, World War Two broke out, was Anna was uh, making regular uh, transatlantic visits to Vito with suitcases full of cash, as much as two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in cash in suitcases every voyage, empty suitcases coming back, all this money going to uh, help um, uh, buy, build a man, a man, a palace for Benito Mussolini. And and uh, uh, to also um, uh, just further you know curry uh, power. Now in 1943, uh, you know World War II comes to Italy when the Allies uh, invade Sicily and then uh, invade uh, uh, southern Italy. And um, eventually, after uh, weeks and weeks of brutal, bloody fighting, the Allies uh, take control of Naples. And they immediately set up Naples as their uh, headquarters and logistical center. So because Naples is a major ocean going cargo uh, shipping port. So Naples becomes the place where all of these uh, uh, supplies and a ammunition and reinforcements and, and, and tanks and troops and, and food and, yeah, and fuel and all that. Naples is the place where all this stuff is, is pouring into Italy to help the allies uh, drive the Nazis out of uh, Italy and wait, what? <laughs> guess who's there to help out? Native of Naples, Vito Genovese, 
shows up at Allied headquarters, volunteers to be a translator, and within just a short period of time, immediately begins uh, taking control of the black market operation um, happening in and around Naples involving the Allies. So what, what Vito was doing was he was hiring his hand-picked people to drive these army trucks from the docks at Naples, not to where the army soldiers needed them, but out into the countryside where that which could be sold for, uh, for cash was, was liquidated and, and things like food and medical supplies were given to the starving and, and poor uh, 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 people in the, in, the, in, the, in the countryside. And uh, after, after, at one point uh, when the army started investigating the black marketeering that was going on, they found an area outside of Naples, <laughs> who knows, maybe it was not too far from Rossignano, um, where they found 40 burned out deuce in the quarter army, you know, freight trucks, you know, burnt to a crisp. Um, and that's, uh, so that's what, how'd you spend the war, Grandpa? That's how Vito was spending the war. Um, but Anna, meantime, went back to New York City during this whole time. She really never, she never really wanted to be in New Jersey. You know, it was always supposed to be just a summer home. And uh, the, uh, <clears throat> so it, it, she took a job in, um, uh, yeah. she took this job. This is a modern photo of a building. Um, uh, as she was the manager of a nightclub called Club Wine 81, um, it imaginatively named because it was number 181 Second Avenue. You can still go to that building and go downstairs, and you will be in the exact same space where Club 81 took place. And now I have to point out when they say that it was the East Side's gayest spot, this is not a place of mirth and, and happiness. This is a transvestite, this is a drag bar. This is, this is a, uh, a, an, an entertainment establishment in which while you are there at night, all the people who look to be women are men dressed as women, and all the people who look to be men are women dressed as men. This is Anna's milieu. This is her specialty. This is the kind of club she loves running, and she was apparently great at it. Now, this is a little bit bizarre, but this all comes from something, you can Google this if you want, you know, kind of like the pansy craze of the 30s. Coming out of the roaring 20s, that sort of anything goes period of the roaring 20s, uh, you know, where women were actually uh, wearing dresses that showed their legs below the knees of all crazy things. And 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 it just really was like sort of an anything goes kind of time. And 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 then heading into prohibition, um, it, it it was it was still it was still a thing that there were, you know, uh, there were out, out, uh, uh, there were men who enjoyed dressing up as women and women who enjoyed dressing up as men and uh, and and uh, a lot of them um, got into the entertainment world and it was a it was a very it was uh, it was and all, by the way very much illegal. Well, every one of these people in this uh, picture can be uh, arrested and put in jail just for dressing up as a woman because it is assumed if you're dressing up as a woman you're a homosexual. It's illegal to be a homosexual, and uh, so the. Uh, now, the, the thing I the thing I forgot to mention about Vito's mansion is that um, uh, shortly after uh, 1937, when he went to Italy, it burned to the ground and under suspicious circumstances. So that's why there that's why there's no trace of that mansion left um, there anymore. And and uh, uh, at the time, Dominic Caruso said that he had subcontractors out there, plumbers, electricians, people putting in swimming pool stuff, gardeners, you name it. In other words, there were all kinds of people out of the property. Maybe any one of them could have left something plugged in or unplugged that they shouldn't have. Um, it, the, the, uh, the, 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 the cause of the fire was essentially blamed on a faulty furnace, but that was just um, speculation. And, and the curious, uh, one curious thing was that it was reported that Anna and the kids had come out a few days before the fire. It was never substantiated, but... Uh, at any rate, given the fact that she never really wanted to live there anyway, you know, who knows? Um, but at any rate, uh, the house was burned to the ground and it just stayed that way for a lot of years. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we'll get to it. Eventually, Vito sold the house back to Dominic Caruso, essentially for the debt he owed him for his uh, uh, improvements. Um, and then uh, Caruso flipped it to somebody else. 
and the property changed hands a couple of times, and then it was donated to the Monmouth County Park System, uh, where it is today, Deep Cut Park, which is an absolute gem of the Monmouth County Park System. If you've never been there, make a make a reason to to go up on those high hills and cut through that area. Those gardens are absolutely spectacular. Um, but at any rate, uh, so, and back in Italy. Vito is uh, running the black markets and uh, feeding uh, Benito Mussolini's kid uh, cocaine. Um, but the allies are starting to catch on about the black marketeering and they are now bringing on investigators. Um, an odd coincidence that the Gerard Vernatico is a baker. Well, this, this, this man, I, I'm showing this tombstone because you otherwise might not believe that there actually was a man named Orange C. Dickey. And when he was in the United States before World War II, he was a baker. Well, the army needed him, and the army decided he was a military police intelligence officer. So he was working for military police as an inspector and an investigator, looking into the black marketeering. And he caught on that Vito, the translator, was behind most of it, and nobody really cared much. Um, and and he was, you know, and in the meantime. Um, you know, uh, communications from, you know, back in, in uh, America, in New York, revealed that Vito is now, he's wanted on murder charges back in New York. But nobody cares there either. You got to remember, this is World War II. American men, heroic men, are dying all over the world under heroic circumstances. You know, the one bum criminal that killed one person is not anyone's major priority. Uh, in, 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 in this point in time, except for Orange C. Dickey, who refuses to let it go. He also refuses a $250,000 bribe from Vito to walk away from the whole thing. And eventually, uh, uh, Staff Sergeant Dickey uh, was able to get uh, prosecutors in New York to um, uh, issue the, uh, the, the, the papers. And so uh, Staff Sergeant Dickey and Vito Genovese shackled at the leg and, and, and wrist took a, uh, a uh, steamer from Italy back to New York so that Vito could face murder charges. So he's arrested, arraigned on murder charges, and then case is dropped when a key witness dies while in police custody. Boy, just all, oh, some people just have the law. This, is a, this was a witness in police custody who had certain medical conditions, so he had to take a number of pills and capsules you know, every day. And somebody had found a way to swap out one of his capsules with what the uh, medical examiner later said was enough poison to, to kill six horses. And so with the lead key witness uh, dead, Vito is a free man. And the judge told him, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna keep skating on this forever. And Vito said, see you later. And he returned to Monmouth County. And that's 1946, buys a mansion in Atlantic Highlands. We believe this is a photo of that mansion from that era, but it, we are not 100% certain. Uh, it was at 130 uh, Ocean Boulevard in Atlantic Highlands, and there's still a house on that very spot. It, it has been significantly renovated and improved since then. Uh, unlike the Middletown Mansion, which was supposed to just be a summer home, uh, this, is, this is meant to be the new uh, year-round residence of the Genovese family. And there's some questions about that. There's questions about why Vito came to New Jersey in, in, to Middletown in the first place. Some people speculate, well, that's just what wealthy Italian men of means did uh, in Italy was, you know, your business, your factory, your offices, wherever, um, were probably in the city and you had your, you know, your villa uh, out in the country. Um, that, that's that's uh, not a very new concept. And so maybe Vito was just doing what wealthy Italians did. but but there were also other art organized crime figures in New York who were moving to New Jersey, and and some have, have speculated that it was out of an, a recognition that if you're committing your crimes in New York State and you are a resident of New York State, that you are a target for state prosecutors, county prosecutors, New York City prosecutors. But if you put a state line between where you live and where your crimes are being committed, all that becomes much more difficult. And we're talking about an era when the FBI was not interested in organized crime. You know, the history of the FBI was like, first we're chasing like bank robbers, and then in World War I, it's you know, saboteurs, and then in World War II, it's 
you know, uh, communists and, and, and uh, you know, so it's like they didn't really get into organized crime um, during this period of time. So this was a way, you know, having a state line between these people. So, you know, for the most part, there's not much evidence that Vito Genovese committed organized crime in New Jersey. And, and that's very much what the idea was. Later on, Joe Valachi said, oh, you know, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to move to New Jersey. And Vito said, well, this is what you have to do. Don't get friendly with the locals. Be seen, mix around, donate to charity, but don't make any friends. You know, keep your distance. Don't talk. And, 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 and uh, so, you know, it was, it was on some levels a front, but maybe in some levels it really was, um, you know, a beautiful mansion overlooking Raritan Bay, just a spectacular house that any of us would be pretty happy to live in. And uh, so over the years, um, this is a house that is just like a lot of other Mama County families. Um, uh, there's a picture of Anna from a home video that you can find on YouTube. Uh, it's just a cup, it's just mere seconds long. Um, but you see how, you know, Anna always presented herself um, meticulously. You know, there, were, there was a book that came out that actually put out all the rules that a mafia wife had to obey. She was supposed to be seen but not heard. She was supposed to be always looking her best. Uh, she was supposed to be uh, a, a fantastic cook, a great hostess, um, and, uh, you know, um, and someone who, uh, you know, didn't listen when the men were talking. and. Uh, and, and um, if somebody asked her, you know, what her husband did, she, she, you know, knew what to say. And Anna was every bit of that. And during these years, this is a house that's full of kids and grandchildren, and the kids are growing up. Nancy and Marie and Phil are all growing up. Um, uh, now Phil's the youngest of them. He he's going to uh, high school in, in uh, Red Bank, uh, and uh, um, in, uh, uh, Nancy uh, is getting married. And uh, we'll look at we'll, we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Um, so, you know, uh, this is where the Mob Queens podcast did some fantastic work using DNA to track down some of Vito and uh, Anna's grandchildren who are still alive. And they told a lot of stories about this period, the Atlantic Highland period, that would make you think of, of anyone you know in your family talking about your own, maybe your own beloved grandparents. Because, you know, when you're kids, you know, your grandparents are doting on you and you don't know what the troubles they're having when you're not around. You don't know what. Uh, the grandfather does to make his money, and uh, so you know these these these, these people uh, are their, their stories are all my nana this and my nana that, and they are full of love and happy remembrances. So this is just another reason. To remember that in a lot of ways, this is just another Monmouth County family, like so many others, but not all as well. And and again, so this is just like any other family, uh, it's not all going well. Um, there's, uh, um, there's problems. And um, there's not a lot really uh, to be understood exactly about a, a, this coincidence. But we finally, we get to 1950. And uh, this is the only known photo that exists of Philip Genovese, um, the son of Vito and Anna. And this is him as a pallbearer at his father's funeral. And uh, uh, but in 1950, a um, story in the Asbury Park Press talked about how Vito and Phil were in a car on Route 9 in Freehold. They got into a very serious car accident. And the people who were in the other car, several of them sustained serious injuries. And there was, a, there was a, some litigation um, that followed that, that, that fell apart because of procedural problems. So once again, um, Vito uh, skated in terms of consequences. Um, but for whatever reason, the very next day was when Anna packed up the kids and moved back to New York City. What was it about that car accident? We don't know. It's just, we don't, it may have been coincidental. She may have been planning to pack and move anyway. So we don't know if it was a straw, but at any rate, that, that is the coincidence that, uh, you know, um, the, the very next day after that, this car accident, Anna moves the kids back to New York. And what she does then, is she uh, initiates um, uh, a, a filing against Vito for what was called uh, separate uh, maintenance. And now in those days, um, if a couple was separated, still married, um, but separated, 
uh, the husband could still be compelled to provide financial support in what would be called uh, separate maintenance. And so uh, Anna filed uh, for uh, separate maintenance for Vito. It gets a little complicated in the legal stuff, but the bottom line is essentially um, it doesn't really go very far and she withdraws it because Vito says, okay, look, I'll fine, I'll pay you. But then he doesn't pay her. And so then eventually she initiates divorce proceedings and these divorce proceedings take place in family court in Freehold, right here in Monmouth County. And what transpires next is unprecedented because what Anna does, and that's her, as always, looking at her immaculate best with her mink collared uh, coat. Um, she took the stand and testified in open court in front of a room packed with journalists and, and camera crews even. This was national news, a mafia wife testifying in open court about everything her husband was doing. The famous quote, her, her famous quote was, Vito's got his sticky fingers in all the rackets. And she detailed that he was making $20,000 a week from the Italian lottery in New York City, and that he had owned countless businesses through various proxies, a dog track in Virginia and, a, uh, you know, restaurants and, you know, um, activities, uh, you know, loan sharking and kickbacks on the docks here and there. Just, you know, she went on uh, about uh, how Vito made his uh, illicit, uh, ill-gotten gains. But she also articulated uh, uh, incredible uh, stories of uh, domestic abuse, uh, infidelity, uh, kissing parties. Um, that went too far um, and um, just, you know, told an incredible tale, an incredible tale of, and you can only, we can only uh, imagine, that she obviously must have felt like she had been betrayed uh, to, to take that kind of a risk. And, and uh, at that time, there was a woman named Dorothy Kilgallen, who was a syndicated newspaper columnist, and she had a nationally syndicated radio show. She's kind of a Howard Stern of her time, the king of all media. And she was covering this from a great distance. And, and she published that, uh, you know, Mrs. Genovese had better take extra care of crossing the street going forward, as it is not expected that she may be with us all that longer. So the expectation was for a mafia wife to uh, spill all this in open court meant that she was a dead woman walking and it was just a matter of time before, or, you know, the mafia did what the mafia does. That went on for two days. There's Vito at the court in Freehold. He looks scared, doesn't he? Oh man, he looks really worried. Uh, well, day three, day three, it's Vito's, uh, day three is uh, when uh, uh, 28 witnesses are called to testify on Vito's behalf. Every single person that Anna named by name took the stand and refuted what she said. Nancy Simonetti, Vito's daughter, took the stand and testified against Anna. As uh, um, you can imagine, this sort of thing caused a lot of schisms in the family that uh, probably still are felt to this day. Um, the point being that at the end of it all, there was a lot of he said, she said, she, well, he said, she said, um, not a lot of, uh, uh, you know, clear whole card fact. And the judge uh, uh, threw them both out. Vito had countersued uh, uh, Anna for divorce, and they both lost their cases. Both divorce cases were thrown out. So Vito and Anna are still married and still under a separate maintenance agreement. But Vito has claimed for all the money that Anna says he's making, Vito has claimed, I only make $250 a week as a scrap paper dealer. Well, you can't live in an Atlantic Highlands mansion, um, but, you know, if you're only making $250 a week as a pa scrap paper dealer. Um, so uh, those chickens are going to come home to roost. Now, where it all comes to a head is that over on the organized crime side, and again, we, we could be here for five hours if I wanted to cover all the... Uh, stuff of that happened uh, with Vincent the Chin Gigante and uh, Joe Colombo and all that stuff. But basically, uh, Vito is ready to make his move 
to be the boss of all bosses, the, the, the top of E2D coffee, head of the mafia. And so they're calling another one of these great big confabs where all the mafia leaders are coming. They're from Cuba and, and Chicago and Vegas and Miami and all over the country, all these mafia leaders. And they decide to have it in a little town in upstate New York. And well, this is one of the dumbest ideas that, that these uh, otherwise really pretty smart people um, have ever had. Um, it's going to be at the mansion of one of their uh, 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 confreres. And um, in preparation for it, word starts to trickle out around town that the local butcher has had to order like an incredible amount of extra beef because apparently there's going to be a lot of steaks being served somewhere. And everyone said, huh, what's going on? Like, it's the worst kept secret that something's going on at this house such that the state police um, are, are kind of curious. And when all of a sudden these fabulous looking cars start rolling into this rural community, the state police set up roadblocks. There's only a couple of roads in and out of this little tiny town. And they just start asking people, hi, what are you doing? Where are you going? Can I see some ID? Of course, some of these people panic. Some of them have warrants out. And they like some of them, some of them ran away into the woods. Others like drove off in their cars, you know, at, at, at you know, blazing speed. In the end, nobody was actually uh, had, you know, now Vito, again, Vito was in a car with five other people uh, from New Jersey, and when they were stopped, he, he merely said, well, we're, we're going to visit a sick friend. But once again, cool as a cucumber, just absolutely skated right past it. But what this did was it gave law enforcement the first true picture of the breadth of uh, the organized crime in America, like just how many cities had you know, these uh, crime families and that they were all interconnected and they were all collaborating and colluding and cooperating. Um, uh, and uh, this was when the federal government did start, you know, following Thomas A. Dewey, that was a special prosecutor in, in New York who went after organized crime figures um, and then became uh, governor of New York. Eventually, the, the, the federal government took an, uh, uh, an interest. The, um, and the, uh, you know, um, during these days, the FBI only had like a, a couple of dozen agents that were involved with organized crime, but there was a different uh, law enforcement group of the federal government called the Federal Narcotics Bureau, and they had taken a keen interest um, in the mafia when the organized crime families decided uh, that they needed to get in on the heroin and cocaine uh, importing business in the United States, which was very controversial, but another story for another time. This is where this is where the chickens come home to roost for Vito Genovese because Vito Genovese did not commit crimes with his own two hands. Um, he he would talk to a a soldier like Joe Valachi and Joe Valachi would go recruit and pick people. Vito would have no idea who Joe picked or chose. He would have he would know absolutely nothing about it whatsoever. Um, and he was you know careful to always sort of be someplace where there were people who could swear he was there the whole time and you know had an alibi and all that. Well. Now there's a, a federal narcotics bureau sting. A bunch of mafia people get picked up in a big heroin bust, and some of them flip and start naming some of the other people who were behind it all. And so, and two of them say Vito was Vito was not only behind it; he was there at the time. He was there on the spot, which is almost impossible to believe. It's, it's almost 99 percent sure he got set up. And when he, you know, and when he was, when he faced trial for this, he told, you know, he was like, you know, if you got me for tax evasion, I'd go quietly. But I, you know what? I didn't do. I'm innocent. He went to jail for something he didn't do, <laughs> in all probability, uh, you know, against the vast majority of all the things that he was responsible for, for which no one ever laid a finger on him. Now he was sent to the Atlanta Penitentiary, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. And if you've ever heard like stories about like how mafia kingpins ran the mafia from their jail cell, well, this was where it was actually true. Uh, they gave Vito the best prison cell. Hey, it's still a prison cell, but it's a suite. It's not like a it's not like a studio apartment. It, it's got room for eight, and Vito gets to handpick his roommates, and they're all his made men, his his lieutenants, and so now he's got his uh, inner circle of, of lieutenants around him, and he's still running his crime family from his prison cell in Atlanta. Uh, along this time, his longtime lieutenant Joe Valachi gets arrested, and he gets convicted and sentenced 
to the Atlanta uh, penitentiary. And when he lands there, Vito says, you gotta come stay with me, come stay in my little suite. So Joe Valachi uh, is now uh, right back in Vito's inner circle, um, only inside of prison. And now a regular uh, thing about the, these guys being in prison is that various law enforcement types show up and say, hey, you come on, come up. And then when their people are taken away for various interrogation and questioning as other people are being arrested, as other crimes are being investigated, that sort of thing. Well, this is happening to Joe Valachi a lot. And Joe Valachi gets the sense that Vito thinks he's ratting on him. And this comes to a head in what was witnessed by apparently a number of people who saw Vito walk up to Joe Valachi and kiss him on both cheeks and then the lips in what was called the kiss of death, uh, a, a mafia sort of way of saying, you're now a dead man. And so Joe Valachi now realizes it's just a matter of time where someone's gonna come up behind him and take him out. And so he, he's there in the prison um, and he sees someone coming up behind him and he's like, here it comes. And he grabs a pipe because, well, you know, it's a federal prison. Of course, there's pipes lying around where somebody can pick them up and grab them. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Anyway, he, he turns around and, and he uh, attacks this person and he murders this guy uh, right on the spot. And it turns out this guy was not after him, mistaken identity. So now the feds have Volacci for an electric chair you know, crime. And Joe decides this is Vito's fault. Vito violated the code by targeting me for death for snitching when I wasn't snitching. Well, you know what? He broke the code. Well, guess what? I'm going to take him down. So, so Joe Valachi is in, in obviously in custody. And uh, the first place the, uh, that they put him is the uh, West Chester County Jail. And uh, he, he starts talking, but he says, get me out of here. Everybody knows that the Westchester County Jail is where the New York City cops put the snitches. And so my life isn't worth a plug nickel. You've got to move me to someplace else. Well, where did they choose to move him? They moved him here. The Fort Monmouth stockade. The prison on the base of Fort Monmouth. Now, this was a World War. This is part of the World War II expansion of Fort Monmouth. It's not there now. It's been long gone. And there's, this is the only known photo that uh, we, we um, were able to get from the Department of Defense. And of course, it's not known to as the the stockade. You can look at the sign there. It's the confinement facility because, of course, we couldn't just go with the stockade. But at any rate, this is the building where Joe Valachi spent six months, and all the time he's. 10 miles from Vito's Atlantic Highlands mansion. And he's in Monmouth County, which is thick of Vito Genovese relatives and crime family members. And those are not the same thing. Uh, a lot of times um, they're completely different people altogether. But uh, at any rate, Joe Valachi spent six months. Apparently he had a photographic memory um, and he, uh, he was willing to tell everything he knew about how the mafia worked. And this is, this is, it is Joe Valachi who uh, made it known that the name that was preferred by the members of, of the mafia was La Cosa Nostra, roughly translated as this thing of ours. And uh, uh, so he provided this incredible value of the distribution, but none of it could be used against him. Well, this is kind of interesting. But, uh, but then again, Joe had, an, had a good lawyer. Uh, Joe had a lawyer named F. Lee Bailey. Made, he was first made his name uh, 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 defending the Boston Strangler um, and who would go on to represent O.J. Simpson and had this very distinguished career. But he negotiated the terms of Valachi's testimony that basically said, you can't, you can't prosecute a guy if he's testing, testifying against himself. That's, you know, that's a Fifth Amendment thing. So, uh, so all of this testimony, it, it keeps him out of the electric chair, but it does, and, and, he's gonna, and he already knows he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison anyway. But at least he's out of the electric chair and he, he's going to be protected. He's going to be in protective custody. So he's not going to get murdered. Um, and his testimony is incredibly detailed and incredibly valuable, such that even at Robert F. Kennedy, uh, United States Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, came to the confinement center and personally interviewed Joe Valachi um, to, to, to get a sense for his um, uh, you know, authenticity, uh, you know, his credibility. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's kind of interesting to remember that Robert F. Kennedy um, came from a family that didn't exactly have a 
distinguished uh, background, you know, the, the, the father of Robert F. Kennedy and U.S. President John F. Kennedy um, was a organized crime leader doing prohibition. That's the cold hard fact. Uh, and in just one generation, that family went from being an organized crime leader to having their leading scion in the White House and the other um, as the Attorney General. At any rate, um, Vito got moved to the uh, federal prison in Leavenworth, uh, where he was not put in a suite and uh, was not allowed to have his um, people around him. And, and uh, he eventually um, got sick and died. Uh, he basically died of old age. Um, and uh, they held a funeral for him in Monmouth County. Uh, he was at uh, St. Agnes in uh, Atlantic Highlands, which was a church that Vito had donated a lot of money to. Um, I, uh, there's, uh, he, he donated the money for the altar. Uh, there's still a, 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 a sign that the, he credits him for that. Um, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> the, um, that, is, that is the how it ends for Vito. What about Anna? Where has Anna been? Well, Anna went back. Anna had gone back. Uh, you know, after you know, Vito stayed in Atlantic Highlands. And by the way, he couldn't stay in that uh, in that house, uh, that mansion. So he had to sell that, and he had to auction off all of the goods uh, to um, uh, gather the money to uh, uh, enable him to pay his uh, separate maintenance. Um, and he moved into another house. Uh, on uh, uh, in, in Atlantic Highlands um, uh, on uh, Avenue C and uh, Highlands Boulevard, uh, um, which was a very modest um, uh, 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 one-story ranch, you know, like a two, three bedroom, one and a half bath, very, very plain thing. And that house is still there. Um, and it was supposedly a rental. It might not have been, but um, he, there was a story in the Asbury Park Press that uh, interviewed his landlord after he had had been arrested and taken away. And he said, oh, he was a very good tenant who always paid his rent on time. But Anna's gone back to New York and she's going back, she's gone back to doing what she loves and that's running these transvestite bars, these drag clubs, which are again, a big deal. These are not like these tawdry little, you know, uh, uh, things uh, like, a, like, you know, some like cheesy little hole in the wall strip bar at 42nd Street. These are elaborate, lavish entertainment spectaculars. Kind of like almost like what you would see in Las Vegas, uh, and, and so uh, so she was the uh, manager of the Club Eighty Two Review um, for a long time. On the, and uh, you see once again because it was at Eighty Two West Fourth Street, um, and uh, you know the people who came to these shows were uh, you know New York Yankees players, uh, uh, Mayor Mayor uh, uh, LaGuardia, uh, uh, you know celebrities. Um, I mean, it, it, even though it was, it was just like a kind of a new kind of prohibition thing where it was all illegal, it was not just tabooed, it was illegal to be there. And Anna had strict rules. Um, if you were, if you were, say, so you see the, the show about Kit Russ, if you were, if you were a man who was going to be entertaining people dressed up as a woman, you had to come to the employee door dressed as a man. And then once you were inside, you changed into your female persona. You had to stay in that persona and you, you were not allowed to break character until you were done with your shift for the day, at which time you changed completely back into your original man or male or female persona. And when you walked out the door, you were, you were, you were a man. And that's how people, uh, you know, escaped detection. And, and Anna was supposedly a genius at, at, at spotting undercover cops and, and always knew to put them at a table where they would be uh, taken care of in a way that, uh, you know, they just weren't going to be able to find uh, uh, any uh, means for an arrest. And she was also not even the least bit um, afraid. She took, she really treated uh, the people who worked for her uh, like family members. And there's even a story that we get from Vito during his uh, court testimony that there was one time when uh, uh, some of Anna's employees were being uh, harassed by a couple of sailors and Anna uh, uh, broke up that um, uh, incident with a bar stool. So she was not a, a shy and, and uh, uh, tender flower. Um, she was tough as nails. And uh, so here we are, Club 82. This is a picture of everybody there. Once again, everybody who looks female is male. Everybody who looks male is female with one exception. And there's Anna right at the center of it all. She still looks great, doesn't she? But then there's a person that uh, came out in the, uh, in the Mob Queens podcast um, that was a person who her given name was apparently Jackie. That's all we know. 
was that her name was Jackie and that she was a woman um, who went through life uh, preferring uh, to dress as a man and, and going about life uh, as a man named Duke. That's Duke right there. And Jackie and Anna um, were together for uh, the, the later decades of Anna's life. She was bisexual and she had been bisexual. This had been known by a lot of people. Um, by the way, Club 82 um, was co-managed by a guy named Stephen Fraze, uh, who was a uh, you know organized crime member, because obviously the mafia is the, is, you know, the organized crime is we who run these illicit um, drag clubs. And uh, it was Vito who decided that this Stephen Fraze character had been the person who had made Anna want to leave him and, and, had, and had come between him. And so Stephen Fraze was yet another person that Vito had Jovalachi um, murdered. Um, and uh, so this stuff was still going on, you know, even after they're separated and not even in the same state anymore. Eventually, uh, you know, there's a question about whether Anna was an informer. Um, so, because the question is, you know, she lived to a ripe old age, she died of natural causes, she never was tapped by the mafia. Who was protecting her, if anyone, and why? And so the Mob Queens people brought in, as, as I said before, they brought in a specialist in Freedom of Information Act requests, and they, <clears throat> and they asked for Anna's FOIA, uh, uh, you know, FBI file. What they received was a heavily redacted file. It was clearly not Anna's file. It was Vito's file. And the expert said, there isn't any question that someone like Anna who testified in open court um, and, and uh, by the way, she didn't just testify there in open court. She, after that, she was called to testify before all kinds of grand juries and hearings and blue ribbon panels. And at every one of single time of those for which there's a transcript or, or information available, she refuted everything she had said in her family court trial. She said, I don't know how Vito makes his money. As far as I know, he just is a scrap paper dealer. You know, oh, did I say something about the docs? I don't know anything about the docs. Um, so she left everybody completely befuddled about what was true and what was not true. Um, and, uh, but the, the specialist in the FOIA request said, well, if, if she had to have had an FBI file, it's almost certain that she did, given how much information she knew uh, and, was, and was talking about. But if the FOIA request does not uh, produce an, 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 an a file, the, the main reason is probably because if she was an informer, those you know people who are informers for the FBI, their files are in a completely different place and are never released to the public ever. Anyone who's an informer for the FBI, your privacy is protected permanently. So that's a head scratcher. What about the Federal Drug Enforcement Department? Would she have been someone who helped set Vito up? Because again, he always had an alibi. So when you know, you know, all these murders that took place that he had he had ordered. Um, nobody could ever make anything stick, but all of a sudden something happened when he didn't have an alibi, and hmm, you just kind of wondered who, who, who could have who could have provided that kind of information. Um, state of New Jersey. Now I, I didn't mention this before, but this is a cold hard fact too. Anna's, Anna's attorney representing her during her uh, divorce proceeding was an assistant attorney general for the state of New Jersey. This sounds vaguely important, so I'm going to repeat that. This is a family court matter, and her lawyer is not a divorce lawyer. Her lawyer is not a private attorney. Her lawyer is an assistant attorney general for the state of New Jersey. Yeah, it's wow. <laughs> Why? Um, and to this day, there's just nobody's ever provided an explanation about that, but maybe he was protecting a source. Maybe he wanted to make sure. Um, you know, that uh, he was guiding testimony that could be used for future prosecutions. Who knows? Mario Puzo, we all know who he is. He wrote this book. For years, Mario Puzo swore that he never, ever spoke to a made man or a mafia chieftain in writing his book, The Godfather. He stuck to, stuck to that story to his grave. Well, Anna's grandchildren in the Mob Queens podcast have vivid memories of Mario Puzo coming by the apartment where they were living in Manhattan 
uh, during the years when Anna's running Club 82, and Mario Puzo's bringing money. And Anna even set up a special bank account for a college fund for, for one of the kids, for Marie, I believe it was, or maybe it was Nancy, but, uh, you know, set up a college fund um, that was based just on the cash that she was getting from Mario Puzo, who apparently visited the house two or three times. Well, uh, if you've read the book or you've seen the movie, you know that for uh, every 10 minutes that they spend on the organized crime side of the story, they, they spend 20 minutes on the family and domestic side. And so it, this, is, this is completely plausible. And let's, you know, let's take it a step further. Um, I mean, why would she, why would she coordinate, cooperate with someone like uh, Mario Puzo? Who knows? But money's a good reason also to put her kind of the narrative out there, maybe to, you know, to say, look, this is how you, this is how you portray the women and the wives. You know, I, I, I can believe it. Let's just take some pictures. Let's look at pictures out here. Famous picture from the uh, early scene in the first Godfather movie, the, the wedding, right? The great big wedding ceremony, an elaborate, just sort of, well, here's how it might have looked in real life. This is, this is Nancy's wedding, uh, Vito's daughter with his first wife. And this is, as you can see, a pretty elaborate affair, right? There's a singer up on the stage, up on the upper left, uh, and uh, they're sitting in front of what we believe are party favors. And then uh, on the right is a seven-story wedding cake. And, uh, you know, all the, all the information we have about this wedding was, again, this was like all the stops pulled out. This was a, an incredible amount of money uh, paid to just put on an absolute spectacle. And so, you know, it's not hard to see if Mario Puzo was going to get the details of this just perfect. He might have had some inside information. Well, uh, Club 82 eventually got shut down um, by the cops. Uh, Anna ends up getting a job here. She's now the new guest services director at the Tony Warwick Hotel in Manhattan. And uh, there's some really interesting, famous people who live here, celebrities. And Anna gets to know some of them. And again, the, some of the grandchildren of the Mob Queen podcast they're telling stories about how their grandma, their Nana comes home, telling about all the Hollywood stories she's heard from her newest best friend, Cary Grant. You didn't see him coming, admit it. You did not see Cary Grant coming. Um, anyway, so Anna, once again, just always has, uh, finds a way to uh, uh, succeed and find her level and be a strong uh, working woman in a uh, era where there weren't very many of them. Um, and like I say, she eventually dies of, uh, natural causes at age 88 and is buried next to her husband um, in a, a simple grave in, uh, in Queens. Um, and uh, it's at this juncture that it's important to, to, to point out that um, I um, have made it a point to stop my research into this story um, at the deaths of Vito and Anna. And two things, you know, things, two things carry on. There's a Genovese crime family that carried on with other leaders and that's, you know, but that didn't really happen in Monmouth County for the most part. So that's not part of the veto story. Now, that would be a separate story, but I've chosen uh, not to follow it. And, and that's because the other thing that carries on is there's a lot of families and people and family members in this community who are related to Vito and Anna uh, and, and their extended family members. Um, and some of this is still really painful for them. Um, some of these schisms um, that, that happened when uh, you have the kind of um, just brutal testimony in court where at one time Anna uh, said that Vito was in love with and having an affair with another direct, another immediate family member. It's just painful stuff that, that lingers. Um, and, and uh, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, I, I did, uh, you know, I, I, I gave this lecture in Middletown a few weeks ago and, and, and I met one of Vito's um, granddaughters there uh, I, I'm, I won't say her name. Um, she uh, had um, just wanted to uh, let me know that, um, that that their upbringing was not fun. It was not pleasant. Um, they 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 weren't part of some big wealthy, happy, lots of money from illicit, ill-gotten gains, whatever. They they were simple, ordinary people. But e everywhere they went, they always knew people were whispering. And they always knew people were pointing, and they always knew people assumed that whatever they said about their family and their past, they probably weren't telling the truth. Um, I, I met a woman in Middletown whose last name was Genovese, 
um, in Italy, the name Genovese, it's kind of like the name Williams, right? So this is a woman who lived her whole life in Monmouth County. Her last name is Genovese, but her family's from an entirely different part of Italy. She doesn't have any DNA or shared family tree with Vito or Anna. Good luck convincing people. Her whole life, everyone just assumes you and your family's bent. You and your family's getting money from something, something, something. Don't try to hide it from us. Not easy. So I've always said, if I... If I thought that Philip Genovese, if I saw Philip Genovese in the supermarket, I, I'd leave him alone. I really would. You know, I mean, he's earned that, hasn't he? Haven't they all earned that? I mean, you know, uh, uh, Philip Jr. wrote a novel in which he sort of imagined the life of a young man, um, much like himself, coming to discover uh, certain things about family members. It's an award-winning book, well worth it. Um, but it is a, it is fiction. Um, but, but just, you know, um, this is a man who served his town, gave back to his community, um, has been consistent in uh, 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 um, wanting to have his privacy respected. And I think that we all, um, that's the least we all owe them. Um, and so with that, let's have some questions. Wow, that was great, John. So interesting. You really did your research, huh? I, uh, I spent, I did, I did uh, like I say, I spent about a, a, a year doing uh, newspaper research, all, the books, which are, uh, you know, again, you know, you're going through all these books and it's all about crime and, and, and uh, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, but so little about what happened in New Jersey. So, um, you know, it's, it's good to see between the Mob Queens and even the Mob Queens podcast, I got to tell you, they don't talk a whole lot about New Jersey either. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, 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 the Deadly Dawn book, goes into a lot more uh, New Jersey detail. Um, but uh, but yeah, that was the thing that struck me was that, that no one had um, wanted to roll up um, just you know what their life and times were uh, in the Garden State. So Anna, she, her, it seemed like her public persona was like typical mafia wife, but clearly that's not who she was. The typical mafia wife wouldn't have known anything about what her husband was doing, did not want to know. I mean, if she heard something, she would pretend she didn't. And if somebody said, did you hear anything? You'd say, no, I didn't hear anything. Anna was a full partner, a full partner with Vito, right? During, she, she said, one of the things she said, again, now this is in her court testimony, which always refuted. So maybe, maybe this is true, but she said, she said she was the only person who knew the combination to the family safe. So mm -hmm. she was very, very much different in, in uh, how much detail she knew about Vito's day-to-day -day operations, about how much she knew about the day-to-day -day operations of mafia leaders in general, so. Hang on, I wanna share, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, remember we had our, um, <laughs> yes. our little contest? Okay, yes. so I think this lady may have nailed Anna. We don't know, I mean, I, I think that, um, at first, I was like, oh, I don't think Anna would, you know, be so bold. But after your presentation, I think she might have been. So Lois Keeley is the winner. She did an impression of Anna Genovese. I think you're going to like to hear it. And uh, for that, Lois wins a year-long membership to MCHA. And we're going to put an NARM sticker on that, which means that um, she can participate in the North American Reciprocal Museum Association participants, which is it's basically a network of cultural institutions across North America. So whatever um, membership benefits we give here at MCHA, they're going to receive the same, you know, at um, the participating institution. So I'm going to play this for you. And so this is Anna, and she's talking to Vito. She's leaving a message on his machine, I think. Hold on. Hello, Vito. This is Anna. I know you're there. You're just not listening to me and you don't want to talk. But I'm telling you, you better talk to me because I'm going to talk to somebody else, the people you don't want me to talk to. And I hate this damn Monmouth County. There's nothing around here to do except go look at birds. And I don't want to look at birds. So call me back, Vito. Otherwise, you are going to be real sorry. I mean it, Vito. Real, real sorry. Hey, what'd you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know what? Now, here's the thing. Um, we do not have any, um, there is no known recording of Anna anywhere. Uh, so we have a, a few uh, brief seconds of her on video. Nobody knows what her voice actually sounds like, but I, 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 that sounds pretty convincing to me. Not bad, uh, I was so proud of her. I thought she did a great job. <laughs> I, yeah, I think she nailed it, I, do, I really do. You wanna turn on your camera, John, so people can ask you some questions? And... Uh, 
do your face. What do I, how do I do that? Uh, start video? No. Yeah, start video. Okay. Cannot start video. Hold on. Let me see. Uh, oh, I got to go into settings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess you have to go into settings, maybe. Mm. All right. Well, while you're figuring that out, where is settings? <laughs> I'm go to the chat. So. Usually it's just a little video camera at the bottom of your screen and you can yeah. click on that. I know, but, it, but it's got a, it's X'd out. Hang on. Oh, All here right. we go. Let's do it this way. Uh, let's go Logitech. Yeah, no, that's the right camera. Well, someone's asking, uh, was Vito involved in bootlegging along the Shrewsbury to Manhattan? Um, he, he wasn't, it wasn't his primary line of business. His, his, um, his most important uh, criminal activity originally was after Dutch Schultz was uh, rubbed out um, at the behest of the uh, other mafia chieftains, um, the the whole uh, uh, numbers racket, the the the, lot, the illegal Italian lottery, um, was was uh, something that Vito inherited and and, and took over. So uh, um, he, he was he was more involved with that. Um, uh, you know, he was he was uh, uh, during during Prohibition was when he was running uh, restaurants and and clubs uh, in Manhattan. You know where they were obviously, you know, using you know um, illegal bootleg liquor. Mm. Uh, um, and let's start video. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. Mm. Mm -hmm. Video settings. Yeah, well, yes. All right. While you're doing that, I'm going to take a look. Um. Joseph is asking, can anyone visit the Genovese Garden you mentioned? Yeah, so you're talking about Deep Cut, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And do we know anything about his parents? No, not, um, absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. um, they, they um, uh, as far as I know, they they never came to the United States. Um, and uh, I, I know I've, uh, I, um, either of them, um, not, a, not a single word that I've ever come across about their, their, their parents or, or any, or really, um, anything about of their lives uh, or backgrounds in Italy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they were probably very quiet people, like most small town, you know. Uh, oh, Lois is here. She says, I'm here. And John, I know where you live. Unmute me. <laughs> Anna. <laughs> oh, my God. She's very funny. <laughs> Hold on. Let me see. Let me see if I can unmute you, Lois. You're a character. <laughs> wow. This. Hold on. These controls. Let's see. Participants. Where's Lois? I can see. I'm looking at Lois. Oh, there you are. Hold on. We have to unmute you. Just one second. Lois, Lois. It's so hard to with these um, Zoom controls. It's I, I lost my arrow. Let me see here. Ask to unmute. Just um, here. Are you able to? Good. There you go. Okay. So, John. Yes. You put your life on the line here, Don. <laughs> <laughs> are, you so? are you messing around with me and my family? You know what you're going against, right? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm, I, uh, I, I respect your, you and your family, and um, I, I have tried to be fair, and uh, but, you know, you're you're a larger than life figure, and your story has gone untold for way too long. You were a formidable woman who was doing uh, taboo things at, at a at a time. It is, we will only barely ever scratch the surface of of understanding who you really were, what made you tick, um, and and what what what's really really true, and what's not. So, John, you think the sweet talk in me is going to make me forget all the stuff that you said? Is that is that what I'm supposed to think? Well, no, that that and our usual weekly cash payoff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lois, thank you so much for uh, for stopping <laughs> in. That's great. You really made it special tonight. Well, you did a great job. I'm so happy that you won. And um, well, thank you. Really um, I was an English major at Monmouth University, so I am a, a schooled in literature, <laughs> but it was great fun assuming her persona. 
Very good. Great, great performance. Thank you so much. Brilliant job, Lois. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have someone asking, who is the assistant attorney general who represented Anna? Well, um, if you go to monmouthtimeline.org uh, and uh, you uh, pull up the timeline of Vito, I don't have his name committed to memory, so I don't, uh, I, I, but, um, but it's, it's, on the, it, it, it's on the website, um, okay. monmouthtimeline.org. Uh, it's it's a subcategory under crime. Um, there's a whole timeline of Vito, Vito and Anna Genovese um, in Monmouth County. Um, uh, he, he, he's, he's, he was not a, a, a particularly prominent name, um, uh, but but um, but yeah, you, you can you can find those details on, on the much much longer and more detailed version of this on the website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and Lori Draz would like to know where's the grave located. Oh, where's what located? The grave. Where are their graves located? Oh, oh, um, um, uh, Queens, St. Albans. Okay. And uh, Mel is asking if they actually lived at Deep Cut, and yes, that is where. The well, house it was a summer home. Right. So it, it was their 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 per, their their regular um, residence was in that apartment building in New York where Eleanor Roosevelt lived, and 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 Middletown was supposed to be. A summer home and they never lived there full time and when they were there they did not get out and mix around in the community but when when they lived in Atlantic Highlands Vito was very prominent in the community uh, he, he walked around very much in open um, uh, by himself uh, to the barber for a haircut and a shave where he left always left a nice tip he was known to stop by the, the fire station and chat up with the boys and throw a couple of bucks in the till to help them out uh, he was very generous whenever anyone asked him uh, to help contribute to a, a cause, um, and, and he was very visible in the community, and people there they loved him. He he donated, a, he contributed a lot of money uh, to the Saint Agnes Church. Uh, you know, he, he's and so people there did not see a murderer. People there did not see a nefarious man who ruined lives. You know, I mean, just literally ruined and and, and corrupted, and and you know, it's like. You know, again, after my Middletown talk, you know, there was a woman who just was effusive in saying we loved Vito. So, you know, he, he had a very he had a very different public profile uh, in Atlantic Highlands than he did um, in Middletown. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, one of those things now I'm going to have to look into this is that Club 82 and the pansy craze of the 30s. I, I, you know, you see like the women starting in the 20s, they're sort of gender bending, they get the right to vote, right, in 1920, and now they're starting to move towards like more masculine fashion, and that was okay, and, and you see a lot of images of that, but I had never seen the men dressed as women. Well, because, again, it was against the law. It, right. It was, it was an assumption that if you're, if you're dressing like a woman, you're not, a, you're, you know, there, were, there was no distinction between a transvestite and a homosexual. Those are those are those are two sides of the same coin in in that in that era. So, uh. yeah, very cool. Now I'm gonna have to go researching that. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any more questions? This was great, John. And uh, it's gonna we'll edit it. We'll put it on YouTube, and that way whoever missed it tonight can see it on our YouTube channel. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Dana. Have a good night, everybody.